Howdy, howdy, folks. This is GM Molly, and um, this is the second episode in What Do, which is covering combat encounters. Um, as before with the first video, which the link should be down below if I'm not a complete potato. Um, another very common question I get asked is how do I balance combat encounters? Combat is usually an integral part of role playing games, so how do you make them good? <laughs> Pretty simple. So, my methodology is number one does it need to be a combat encounter um combat is one of those things that it's very marmite for a lot of players so people either love it or hate it or they want a lot more of it or a lot less of it or whatever and this does kind of come down to knowing your players but personally it depends on the system i'm using like some systems handle combat beautifully um feng shui or one or feng shui or what I'm going to call it by Atlas Games, um, first ed well revised edition, not second edition, which is actually the fourth edition of the game. Uh, yeah, they fantastic, fantastic game. You can rip through combat. It is tip top, toppity tip top, top notch. Um, whereas say original Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, or um, Shadowrun First Edition, or even Dungeons & Dragons, like, the game can slow down a lot with combat, particularly if you've got ones with lots of little moving parts, and, you know, you've got multiple spellcasters or people with those kind of abilities. So, if the game system supports lots of flashy combat, yeah, sure, throw it in. But likewise, if a game supports flashy combat and it's easy, it's probably not as difficult to balance because you've not got all those moving parts. So it's, it's you know, swings and roundabouts. Um, another thing I do is before I've even planned anything, I make sure that my campaign has like signposted motifs for the players. I don't explicitly say to them, oh, by the way, rat men, there's always a drumming noise before the combat starts or whatever. But I give them an overall idea of like, okay, you know, if this was a Tarantino movie, the soundtrack would start going wee wah, wee wah, at the moment, you know, I try and give my players an idea of when combat is likely to occur so that they can decide whether or not they want to engage in the combat or not. Um, I do a podcast with two wonderful players called Aetherstone, uh, Links, Doobly-Doo, and all that lot, and um, they have become the grand dark mistresses of avoiding combat. In the latest episode we recorded, which hasn't been released while I'm recording this, um, they managed to dodge like four combats back to back, just in a kind of chef's kiss manner, which pissed me off, but meh. So yeah, try and make sure that your players have a signpost that, okay, thing is going to happen. Do we want to do thing, or do we want to do something else, or do we want to plan, or let's psych ourselves up for combat? Um, after that, Remember that combat encounters do not just have to be the monsters. Um, you can ruin a player's day by getting a monster in its home that it knows how it works, acting in an appropriate manner. You know, um, even simple ones like, okay, uh, they go into a kobold den. Cool. All the roofs are four foot high because kobolds are, you know, two and a half, three foot tall. There you go. Philly boots. Um... So remember, you don't always have to have it just be the monsters, like the raw stat blocks of the monsters. Um, you can make it so that there are variables in the environment, be it that you know they're fighting on home turf or they're fighting on enemy home turf even, or things like that, which can let you tweak things on the fly. A lot of this, I'm going to be honest with you, is a bit like playing by ear. Um, you're looking at making sure that you can tweak values invisibly um, so the players feel like the combat is always working, but you're, you know, oh, I'll make sure that that doesn't, and this does, and, and kind of walk a bit of a tightrope. Um, easiest one, smart monsters can be dumb. Dumb monsters acting smart, players hate. You know, if you say, just pulling an example out of my, my ass here, have a blue dragon that has been shown to be susceptible to fire damage, and then have said dragon swim through a lava lake to escape for no good reason, or having monsters have counter spells prepared that exactly match the spells the characters have. That, no, that's a feel bad. Like, don't make dumb monsters smart, but you can make smart monsters dumb. You can have a mind flayer go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the party, and 
the players will write in the fiction of like, oh, they clearly thought they were better than us, blah, 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 blah. That's always a nice one. So keep in mind that you can make smarter people act dumber than they are in order for the for the thing to balance. Obviously, like, the guy's not just going to pull a pistol out and blow their own brains out, but they might not shoot optimal targets. They might not act in the kind of perfect way. So that can be a good balancing factor. Um... I mean, I'll be honest with you, a lot of my reason for hating, not hating, but um, for trying not to put in combat, is the time cost. So me and five players can role play an entire negotiation with a king, real tense, kind of, you know, gripping role play stuff. And that can take two hours. But realistically, that's about two hours of in-game time that has been taken by discussion by talking by building up this narrative with the players whereas you can have it with combat that in two hours you effectively have five people go uh does a 19 hit okay 10 damage next does a seven hit no okay next does a 15 hit you know, and you can have two hours of play time become mm, six minutes of world in-game time. And it can, you know, it makes things go very weird and elastic. So that's one of the really things I keep in mind, particularly because my games tend to be on a fairly tight schedule. I usually don't have a lot of time to run games, so I can't run like 12 to 15 hour sprawling games like I used to. Um, so I kind of want most bang for buck for my players. So that is that's something to consider outside of balancing encounters. Um, there are three things I do, which I really, really, really come to rely on. Uh, number one is I use hits rather than HP, which is basically where I imagine that the players are in a movie, effectively. So they're in John Wick. And uh, if you watch John Wick... He shoots people. Yeah, sure. Um, but each person has like a number of hits before they go down. And I try and take that. So I think, okay, narratively and cinematically, what's the appropriate number of shots that would take out bad guy X? Or the, the appropriate amount of sword stabs that would take out bad guy Y? And then if there's a particularly good hit, I will, you know, I'll say, okay, well, in my head, right, that's, you just rolled a max damage crit, that counts as two hits. Or, you know, a particularly crap one. And once again, it's going by flying by the seat of your pants, but you can build that feeling if you think of it in terms of narratives you already understand, like books and movies and TV series. Um, another thing I use is what I call the just barely trick, which is where I will say, oh, you know, he's just barely hanging on, which means in GM speak, I want another attack with this monster. I think that would be dramatically better. Or, you know, oh yeah, you you stab him and he, he goes as if he's going to, he raises his spear like he's going to hit you and then his eyes roll back and it seems like you've just barely killed him, which is, oh, these guys are a bit tougher than I thought. So I think I'm going to reduce the number of hits they take so the players can kind of eke out a win. So yeah, remember, just barely is your is your perfect, perfect line to make players feel like they're kind of scrabbling at the edges rather than outright succeeding or failing. Um, and another thing is leaving the players with an out. Um, how long ago was this? This was the first game I played with my current partner. So we're probably talking five or six years ago. Um, I was running a game, they came under attack by Ratmen. Uh, it was uh, Labyrinth Lord, which is an OSR retro clone thing. First edition D&D, &D, effectively. And they're fighting these Ratmen, and then they suddenly realise, oh crap, there's more Ratmen than we can kill. This is bad. What do we do? And they were all new players, and so I just said, well, you can run away. And they were like, oh yeah, we can, can't we? And so they ran away. And they survived, and they came back later on with a plan to deal with the Ratmen. So giving your players an out if you have created something that is accidentally too strong can be brilliant. And letting your players know from square one, okay, you know, you can run away, you can do this, you can call for backup, etc, etc, etc. Some people might be so hardcore you have to come back and give another crack at them. 
that's fine. There's no like secret cabal of dungeon masters, or if there is, they won't let me in. So fuck them. Um, yeah, give your players an out. However, do not always give your players an out. This is not necessarily a combat encounter thing for like a given campaign, but if you're running with the same group or groups over time and you want to kind of cultivate your skills and reputation as a... Sorry, I don't know what that noise was. Um, cultivate your reputation as a GM. You let your players lose sometimes. I mean, bad things happen. I was running Return to the Temple of Animal Evil in 3.5 for some players and they died. They got in a combat they couldn't solve and they died. And it was crap, but... Them's the breaks. Them's where the dice fell. So, yeah, sometimes you've got to let them lose. So, yeah, to kind of reiterate over the points, I did ramble a bit, but that's who I am. Um, does it need to be a combat encounter? Understand the system you're using and how combat impacts that in terms of time taken. Like, how much time is it going to take up by having that encounter in there? Can you afford it, so to speak, in your session time? Um, make sure you signpost things to the players like that they can run away or when they can recognize that combat is happening things like that then make sure that you can make a smart monster dumb and you can do things just barely so you can you can fudge things down for the players um, because then they feel powerful whereas if you throw a load of crap things at them and then you have to boost them up the players can feel a bit cheated so I tend to try and push down rather than build up. But hey, you know, monsters or the, uh, the opponents have in the environment that they're within, um, which can also affect combat. So if the players move out of that environment, it can make the monsters easier or harder to fight. And you can have cool things like kicking people in pits and stuff like that, you know, which is pretty baller. Um, and then finally, yeah, think of it like, think of it cinematically. Think of it from the feeling you want to give your players when they're doing it, which can allow you to then divorce yourself from the hit point system to a hits based system. And yeah, hopefully that helps. Or I just rambled for a while and you have to deal with that. So hmm. um, please join the community, all that stuff. Uh, links down in the doobly doo. Thank you for listening to me waffle on. There will be a new video on Wednesday. Um, and assuming this one has uploaded, it should be Sunday, but I, it's YouTube, so yeah. Well, thank you ever so much for watching. Subscribe, like, all of the nonsense I'm supposed to say. And uh, yeah, see you soon. Keep having fun. Keep being awesome. Bye-bye.